Hi, I'm Jessica Kinsey, the Director Curator at Southern Utah Museum of Art. Welcome to this week's Apex. Um, I uh, would like to introduce you to Cara Despain. She's an artist working in film and video, sculpture, photography, and installation, all addressing issues of land use, the desert, climate change, visualizing the Anthropocene, land ownership, and the problematics of frontierism. She was born in Salt Lake City in 1983 and currently lives in Miami. She's working between the two locations. She holds a BFA from the University of Utah, which she got in 2006. And in 2012, she was selected for the Salt Lake City Mayor's Award in the Visual Arts. And in 2016, um, she was selected for the South Florida Consortium Fellowship. Her work is included in Rubel Family Collection and the Shoal Collection, as well as the State of Utah and Salt Lake County Art Collections. Recent exhibitions include, It Doesn't Look Like Paradise Anymore, at Southern Oregon University, Free, at Brickell City Center in Miami, Crying Out Loud, at the Center for Contemporary Arts in Santa Fe, Fringe Projects, and Slow Burn at Spinello Projects, and No Man's Land, at Rubel Family Collection, all in Miami. In 2014, she was the art director for the feature-length feature film, The Strongest Man, that premiered at Sundance Film Festival in 2015, as well as A Name Without a Place, which premiered at the Miami International Film Festival in 2019. Currently, you can see um, Kara's installation from dust at Southern Utah Museum of Art here on campus, which is on exhibit through May 1st. So now please join me in welcoming Kara to Spain. Kara, welcome. It's so great to have you here. We've been talking about this event and your, I've seen your work at SUMA and as, as Jessica said, it's on until May 1st. So, and I know we're going to be talking about it today. And so I'm so excited to get started. Um, I know that we have lots of your work as examples in our, um, uh, in slides. And so we're going to get that screen share going and start looking at that. And you can kind of help us through a little and we're going to have a conversation. So let's get going. Tell me who you are. What are we looking at? How did we get from there to here? What's it all about? Awesome. Um, so I tend to I tend to like pack in a lot of images to my presentation. So don't be scared. We'll go through them fast. And Lynn, at any point, if you want to jump in and ask a question or give me a speed bump, then feel free. I love it. And just let us know when you want to move the slides and how fast you want us to go and all that. Perfect. Um, so I'll talk about this for just a second and then let you know when to start cruising through. Uh, so I was born and raised in Salt Lake City, Utah, and my family all is, originates in Utah, so I have a deep connection there. And I've been living in Miami for about nine years. Uh, it's a pretty weird transition in a lot of ways because the places almost couldn't be more different. Um, but I actually find some interesting parallels between, you know, settlement and stuff like the railroad and industrialization, et cetera. A lot of my work is still centered on the, on the desert, as Jessica mentioned. And, you know, I've been circling around land use and the Anthropocene for some time. And kind of, especially now that I'm in Miami, it's an interesting thing for me to play with that lineage of, of landscape depiction. And I don't think that it only relates to the Western United States. I think there's a very clear global corollary there. Hmm. And one that's really interesting and actually says a lot about not only our disposition, but our perception all over the world as US Americans. So I, I like to start with this slide. It's Super Utah for, for this audience. Um, but it's, it's an artwork that I made. It's a phony. Uh, but I, I found a, an old rusty spike on some railroad tracks in Miami, and I had it plated in 24 karat gold. Of course, this is a relationship to the real golden spike that was driven at Promontory Point in northern Utah in 1869 and joined the railroads and joined the east to west and joined the world. And what's significant about 
that moment is using technology, we, we changed everything forever in that region, but also all over the world. And I also think of it as the golden spike in sort of scientific geologic terms related to the Anthropocene. And the Anthropocene is just for those that might not know, it's the current geologic epoch that we're in. So scientists have, have kind of been looking at a time where we left the Holocene, which was the epoch before, and, and have entered a period where humans have sort of irrevocably influenced the fossil record and left our mark permanently from the sort of changes that we've been imposing on the earth and the climate. That's a very broad description, but that'll, that'll do. And when they're talking about when that started, they call it the golden spike moment. Oh. We'll circle back to, to some more of that later. Uh, so we can go through the next couple of, of slides. So landscape painting, um, I threw in some Maynard Dixon for, for you all in Southern Utah, but landscape painting in general in the Hudson River School, all the romantics sort of put in our psyche this, this idea of this verdant Western frontier that we should go out and settle and extract. And it's actually surprising, you know, if you, if you look at our grown up in Utah, like I have, you see landscape painting of some form sort of ad nauseum. And as much as I, I don't mean to, you know, talk badly about that, I, I love that stuff in many ways, but it's interesting to me what persists about that attitude toward landscape. Uh, you can go ahead. So it also comes out in, in culture and in cinema. These are two John Ford films shot in Monument Valley. We're definitely going to circle back to this later. Uh, but this is something that I think plays out on the world stage. So the world, especially in the 1950s and 60s when these films were being made, people really got connected to that, that nostalgic sense of the frontier. And by the way, I, I'm not sure the frontier ever existed as it did in those movies, but there's this fierce desire for it um, culturally. And that'll come back around later too. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So, you know, this is just kind of fragmenting it and, and looking at granular, yeah, granularly how it breaks into culture. So I love uh, There Will Be Blood. Uh, also, though, when we now in the age of social media, we travel so differently and we interact with places and spaces so differently. And there's this very weird, like, influence or lifestyle situation happening. So just thinking about how these how these depictions are further getting pushed into this sort of weird ownership and desire that is, is sort of unreal. Looney Tunes, um, Warner Brothers cartoons, I, I draw from that a lot, so we'll see that in a minute. Uh, next slide. So Ansel Adams is a great example of uh, somebody that abided by that romantic concept. Uh, he was an environmentalist, but he photo photographed, you know, a lot of the West and the Eastern Sierras and these beautiful black and white photographs. But, you know, the reality of what exists in the West is, is quite different than all of this that we're talking about. Next slide. So this is right by where that photograph was taken in the Eastern Sierras. This is the intake for the LA aqueduct, which changed everything, for example, um, damming and, and Moving around water in the Western Territory meant that Los Angeles developed very quickly. Um, that's not the only thing that was impacted, but suffice it to say, these are these are the kinds of things that that I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Hoover Dam, or sorry, Lake Powell Dam. Next slide. The Bingham Mine. Many of you will recognize that in the from the Salt Lake Valley, largest open pit mine in the world. Next slide. Fracking plume. Next slide. Wildfires, which have been getting worse and worse. Um, but of course, all, all of this is, is, all of these are symptoms of large scale systems changes. Right. And I think that unless there is a outright catastrophe or a large mine or something that's visible to us, it's difficult to see the effects as they play out over decades and centuries. And with something like wildfires, you know, it's, it's decades of forest management or mismanagement or management in a particular direction that have arrived us at this point. 
add to that climate change and add to that people pushing out into urban interface zones and you just get a tinderbox. But it's it's a more long lasting and, and deeper issue than just these horrible fires that we see on on the news. Next slide. That's the, the 2020 fire season from space. So again, from the ground, it just looks misty, but there's, there's a climate-wide situation happening, even just with fires from one region. Next slide. Uh, this is the Nevada test site. Next slide. But the situation, again, this is mining in Monument Valley, and we're going we're gonna to dig deep into this later, but, you know, you might watch stagecoach and wow monument valley is this beautiful backdrop for all these westerns but there's an entire legacy of uranium there for just one example there's contaminated drinking water there for just one example it's on uh, dineta navajo land and there's a whole host of social problems and poverty problems because of how that played out next slide so this is some of my older work, and hopefully this will kind of tie together what I'm thinking about in, in terms of the legacy of land and ownership and how it's perceived versus, versus how it is. Often something I like to do is get people a little bit cozy and, and feel like they recognize or have a sort of response to, you know, like something like cinema. It feels familiar. It feels grand, interesting, maybe kind of novel, and then undermine those romantic ideas that something like the cinema and landscape painting have established. So this is a piece called Slow Burn installed at Spinello Projects in 2016. And it's a four channel installation. And the next slide will show you the action of the video. You can just play a short clip of it. There's that Looney Tunes. Uh, you can pause it. Yeah, we can go. Emily, you can go ahead and pause it. Great. We can, yeah, pause. There you go. And Great. while we're stopped, I wanted oh. to ask you about how you made that because I saw some, some yeah. things online about that process and y that flame is burning through the canvas or through the work. Oh, okay. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so the first in the videos, I, it was actually a sneaky forced perspective thing that I shot in my studio. So I took 35 millimeter slides from my family's extensive collection of landscape pictures. Thanks mom and dad. And I, I built a berm and then I shot it close up. So it looked like it was in situ and, and burned it. For these, the photos that I made that accompanied that show, um, I took it just another step further and I, I frame these in a shadow box frame with the photo. And I shot these photos myself on 35 millimeter film. And then I string it through the little holes you can kind of see there on the sides. Mm -hmm. And then I burn it inside the frame. Oh. So it smokes up the glass and it gets ash in the bottom and it ruins the photo. And that's kind of a way to talk about like wrecking a precious medium, which is landscape photography, but also kind of smoking out the planet and hot boxing it. Oh, okay, cool. Ah, uh, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, so this is some work that I've been doing uh, with, about the fires. And I've been collecting debris from different burn sites. I started with the Malibu fire and Paradise, which were both horrific. I use those to basically saturate large scale canvases in just the carbon residue. Next slide. So. It, it feels important to me to go to these sites and collect the debris myself so that I'm seeing the area, I'm seeing the burn scars. Uh, and then there's a very real connection. It's, it's unmediated. It's just the material. It's just the aftermath. Uh, next slide. So that gives you kind of an idea close up of what's happening. I just use them almost like drawing tools. Next slide. And this one is seven by 10, I believe. I started to erase the, the sites or the fires where I collected it. And I think of them as landscape paintings of the new American West. I'm gonna be going to Australia later this year. I was supposed to go last year uh, to collect um, debris from the bushfires. So they're sort, of, they're sort of testaments or memoriams to these, these fires. When you see them in person, they smell you know, like ash. 
They're pretty confrontational. They're sort of formal and they trick, again, they sort of trick you in that way of like, oh, it's this big, pretty uh, black canvas. It's, it's like a Rothko or something, but it's, it's meant to, to be very confrontational. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So that's the biggest one I've made, eight by 14 feet, uh, again at Spinello Projects. And I've since erased the word paradise into it. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, but that's debris from the Paradise Fire. So it's very, it's very heavy. It's very intense. Paradise, um, it was pretty shocking to see the, the condition on the ground there with everything just burned down and only chimneys left and windshields melted out. Um, you know, it's certainly not the, the beautiful forested or bucolic Western landscape that you see depicted. Mm. Uh, and this is this is an installation on the side there called uh, Seeing the Stone, which I'll get to in just a sec. At what point did you decide to take the word paradise out? Uh, you know, I, I went to the Anderson Ranch residency last year, which was incredible. And I was working on these pieces while I was there. And I had been like toying with the idea of text for a while, but there was something just a little like stuck in my craw about it. I was just a little uneasy and I don't I think it was because you know the first fires I started with were Malibu and Paradise and I was feeling like it was a little Ed Ruscha mm. um, or a little I didn't want to take it too too far into pop or too, something was bothering mm. me about it but then I resolved that mm. and I tried it out the first one said Reagan Library uh, and I, I really liked it and I felt like I want both to exist in any given exhibition of all of these carbon paintings, but I, I think it feels good as a lead in point and a sort of invitation mm -hmm. to have some text on some of them. And you also mentioned it as being sort of the new landscape painting, you know, for, for, for obvious reasons that so much of our landscape is now looking this way. Um, I wonder if, I mean, do you, do you see it as being a phase that ends or do you see this as continuing on this way? I mean, because I could imagine that you could travel all over the world, as you said, Australia, and this, this work could, could consume so many locations. Yes, um, great question. So I obviously don't wish for these catastrophic fires to continue. Um, but so long as they do, I, f I feel inclined to document it. Mm. And, you know, I would love to go, for example, to the Amazon and collect a brief. For and again, when, when we use the term wildfire, that's a bit of a misleading term because a lot of these, like in the States, are urban interface zone fires that are started by people or a lot of fires are started by cars. Uh, in the Amazon, a lot of these were intentional burns for you know, cattle raising. That's a whole other tangent that I could go on. But yeah, I, I want to continue doing them so long as there's a call for it. And that's just so interesting for, for our audience here and, and for those of you who are watching either with Art, Art Insights Online or various things. In, in two weeks, we have an author coming, uh, Jordan Fisher-Smith, who wrote Engineering Eden and is currently uh, writing a book all about fire. And, and, it, and it is all about the land manipulation um, that has led to, uh, especially in our national parks, that has led to some of these uh, environments that are even more conducive to the wildfires that are that are human induced or or car induced, as you said. So it's kind of an interesting through line that's going to go through at least our our oh, conversation yeah. here on campus. Yeah, it's relevant out there. Don't we know it? I was also curious, just while we're chatting, um, about your relationship to sort of the more romanticized landscape photography. Um, I watched the little documentary that PBS did on you, and it was very interesting. Uh, you were talking about sort of your your maybe your your childhood view of your landscapes, you know, and the impact that that had on you, uh, and the importance that it had on you in relation to, say, looking at neighborhoods per se. And I was I was curious. Um, what your initial relationship to sort of the romantic uh, landscape style was and, and at what point did that shift or, or was it always kind of part of your aesthetic in that way? Uh, inter interesting. So I would say definitely when I moved to Miami, that distance 
gave me a little more like freedom to express it in in the more critical way that I'm interested in. Yeah. Also, I I I never want to leave myself out of any thing I'm critiquing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't want to ever be a finger wagger. So I I want to own the fact that I also experience a certain sense of nostalgia. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm I live in a place that's beautiful. Love the weather. Love Miami. But it is emphatically flat. Um, and I miss the desert and I miss the mountains every day that I'm here. Uh, so when I first got here, I think I was sort of sorting through some of that weird. And anybody, a lot of my friends that have left Utah, we all talk about this. Like there's this very strange, deep feeling of being kind of disconnected from that place. And I can't imagine, therefore, what it must feel like to be displaced as many other people have, especially in the in the Western territories. Um, but, you know, I... I started to sort through that on a personal level because of that slide archive, especially that my family had. Um, I had the privilege of of going and camping and hiking and hanging out in the Red Rocks and the Wasatch my whole life. And I feel extremely lucky to have been able to do that. And, you know, my parents were always taking pictures, but my my dad especially would kind of, oh, good family photo, but kind of get us out of the way so that he could just take these everybody is inclined to do it. It's so funny. And it's a way of like wanting to capture it for yourself and sort of like, Oh, look at this photo that I took. Oh, you know, I I'm, I'm owning this little piece of it. And so as I started to work through that personal level of it, I, I got into the meat of it. Cause I was like, Oh, I'm coming from within this kind of problem that I'm critiquing. Yeah. And I think it gave me a little bit more space to, do it in this sort of like self-qualifying way yeah. because I, I, I know where we spin out on it. And you can, you can follow that sort of sense of, of entitlement um, in a lot of different directions. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. All right. So seeing the stone, um, I, I really love this project. Um, I'm excited to be able to share it with you all because it was super Utah centric. Um, I was invited to have a solo show at Quack in 2016 and Quack is, is no longer, but it was this awesome art center that Adam Bateman was running first in central Utah, then in, in uh, Salt Lake. And when he invited me, um, I was like, well, you know, I had already been living here for several years. And I was working through all this landscape stuff and I was like, but I can't do that in the same way in Utah because it, you know, here I can, I can show these big, beautiful landscapes or videos like the one that I showed before and it, it lands on people different. They get very romanticized by it still right. because it still feels like a novelty to a lot of folks on the East Coast. So in, in Utah, I was like, I'm not going to get away with that. I've, and I also want to do something more critical because that's that's kind of my my line of thinking. So what I ended up doing was traveling. I did a ton of research. I often do a lot of research and a, a lot of field work. So I I kind of narrowed down a bunch of sites all over that had sort of weird history or significance with settlement, uh, mining, weapons development, uh, you know, Mormon pioneer stories and. I went to these sites and I cast rocks that were totally unimportant and I left them there. I cast them in situ using materials that paleontologists use. So I didn't hurt the rocks that I left behind. And then I put the concrete surrogates in, in the quack space with, with their, you know, hung at their relative elevations and with the GPS coordinates of the original rock. And I, I published a, a field guide and there was a very ridiculous, um, invitation for people to go and find the original and to then ruminate on on the sort of darker or weirder history or unknown history of that site. Uh, So these are this is kind of some of my research, a little picture of the field guide. Uh, And then there was also an invitation just like I was kind of talking about the sort of absurdity of of having to capture your own view and there can be a thousand photos of delicate arch and a thousand, you know, so I was like, okay, go get the view yourself because in the gallery, I'm not going to give you anything and, and put it at this hashtag. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, this is an insert from the, the field guide and we'll come back to this later. This is a, a rock from the Temple Mountain area in the 
San Rafael Swell, I'll say it in the, in the parlance of the land. Um, I've, I love when my Spanish speaking friends come to Utah because they're like, what are you saying? Um, I'll, how are you, what are you doing? Uh, this is a place where, you know, it's rumored that Mary Curie came and, and looked for uranium uh, on the Colorado Plateau in this area, but there's a bunch of, of abandoned uranium mines and yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that some more, but this is just an example of what you would see in the field guide. A very unglorious picture of the original rock. Um, this is a conglomerate that's very typical of that area. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so this is how they were, I got to cast dinosaur bones, by the way. Um, I can tick that off my lifelong dream goals. Well, uh, I, I read about that and, and you got special permission to cast those, if I recall. I did. Yeah. I did. I was thrilled. Um, this is kind of, you know, after I just got done saying, oh, these rocks are not like very interesting or important. The exception would be the, di the dinosaur bones. Um, I, yeah, I was really lucky. I, I made some phone calls. I dug around. I talked to some, some BLM people, uh, Bureau of, of Land Management people that manage area and also some paleontologists and got permission from the price quarry. And, uh, so this was about fossil fuel and the belief by some religions that uh, the earth is only 6,000 years old and that these things were put in place for us to use. Uh, next slide. So this gives you a sense of overall how the installation was, uh, was hung. And I just wanna say real quick, um, you know, because I harp on geotagging so hard now, uh, I, I did that at this time I don't think I'm a famous enough artist that I was creating a run in any one of these places. Um, and, and these coordinates were, were important to me, but I, I don't think I would do that really again moving forward. I definitely don't encourage people to geotag things like ancestral sites. Um, none of these were, but still, I just want to kind of like put that out there. Um, you know, it was a part of this project, but it, and I do feel like it was a bit different, but I, I have like interesting feelings about that now. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to ask you, you, you recently had a, an article in hypoallergic, I think, dot com about the, mm -hmm. the Utah obelisk uh, yeah. that, the, that was put out. And, and you spoke quite strongly, um, you know, a, a sort of against the geotagging and the Instagramming of going to these sites. And so I was I was curious how that related yeah. to this project. And and also um, I, I looked the field guide is still available on your website, I think. And so if people want to. Yeah read and, and sort of read about the sites a little bit more. They can find it there. I found it very interesting. It's great to hear you talk about it because it really brought it all together for me, not having seen the, the installation. Yeah, cool. Cool. Um, yeah, what, like, for example, uh, one of the sites is, is the Mountain Meadows Massacre site. That's relevant to you all that are local in right. Cedar City. And my my line of thinking was, you know, if people instead of just going and Instagramming themselves at the edge of the Grand Canyon, um, go go stand at this, uh, pardon my critique, but go stand at this half-assed monument at the Mountain Meadows site and and ruminate on that. If you're going to get to somewhere and go to somewhere, let's talk about you know what happened with settlement in this area and how complicated it is and how violent it it got at different points and what histories are hidden there. Well, and that's kind of a perfect segue to what we're looking at next, which is the work that you, that the, the turn that your work has taken more recently um, into some of the more violent uh, aspects of um, what has gone on in Southern Utah. So I'd love for you to, to, to go into that. Cool. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this full circle with the <clears throat> golden spike. So a lot, of, a lot of the scientists, and there are several dates that are kind of put forward for the Anthropocene's beginning. Uh, one of them is the, the golden spike moment. Um, and one of them is the onset of atomic testing. Mm. And the argument there, and again, I'm, I'm definitely giving you the abridged version. I'm not an expert. I'm an artist. Uh, but, you know, the, the reason for that is, that as soon as we started messing around with subatomic splitting and fusing and, and all of these things that usually only happen in outer space, uh, we opened a portal that just could never be closed again. 
And from this moment, this is the Trinity test, the first atomic test ever that happened in New Mexico. <clears throat> a lot of you are probably familiar with this. Um, you know, it's, it, the world was different forever. There's radionuclides in our body that, in everyone's body on Earth, they're in the atmosphere forever. Um, that's, that's just that. We changed what particles exist on the planet, and we also opened up this new technology that, that you can't put back in the bottle. And the thing that, again, you know, I'm very focused on this region, but absolutely the legacy of nuclearism and testing has a global impact. And absolutely it's tied into, in this very bizarre way, frontierism mm. and culture. And we'll dig some of that out, but I'm, I'm fascinated, for, fascinated by it for that reason, but also horrified. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my mom did grow up in the Cedar City area. She was born in a tiny little town west of there, Newcastle, and she kind of grew up between the two. And she, she's a downwinder. Mm -hmm. Luckily, she, she did not develop any illnesses, and my grandmother probably didn't either, although we don't know for sure. But they were in that region there is like a personal connection there. Again, you know, I've heard so many awful stories of, of illness and, and prolonged legacies of it, but there was also a personal reason for me wanting to kind of core this out. So if we can go to the next slide. It, again, with the cinema. So we have this very romantic idea of the region. Um, also this very remote idea of the region and you know it's this is and it seems silly but in the 50s and 60s when at the same time these tests were happening this is what people were seeing and, and perceiving about this region and they had no real way or reason to necessarily think otherwise um, of course it ignores all of the indigenous history it also ignores just life in that area in general and it promotes a certain attitude and sense of this lone frontiersman, this gruff character, this, this masculine, you know, figure that's going to kind of solve all the problems. And I think that that's somewhere in the psyche too, when it comes to how things played out. Uh, if you go to the next slide. So in my work in general, I'm often thinking about sort of breaking the fourth wall, meaning that I want to, I want to, take you outside of the set and look at, have you look at the setting and, and look at the reality versus what is depicted. So this is a large scale piece. I'm actually going to show it very soon in my show here. It's 16 by 19 feet. It's a 35 millimeter photo that I took when I was in Monument Valley with Signal Fire on a residency. And um, I kind of was just playing with that idea of treating a place as a backdrop and that can, that, entitlement that violence can can go in many different directions so it literally exists it's a photo backdrop fabric piece it literally exists as a backdrop next slide uh, this is just a crappy picture of it as it was hanging in my studio just to give you a sense of scale i had a studio in an abandoned mall for a second so that there was a very uncomfortable situation between those two, <laughs> the setting and the object uh, next slide so this, this is a reality. So on, on the Navajo Nation, there are over a thousand abandoned uranium mines. And when you're, when you're watching Stagecoach or you're watching the searchers, you're, you're not getting that. Um, even though those mines were very active during the shooting of a lot of John Ford films and other Westerns, um, there was a lot of exploitation happening and there was a lot of illness happening at that time too. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed with, with history, but it's, it's not just history, it's the present. You know, uh, all these sites are contaminated. The, they weren't properly remediated, very many of them. Um, at Church Rock, a little in New Mexico, a little uh, east of that, there was a horrible spill from a tailings pond. And that, that was the biggest uranium related disaster ever. And these, these problems really haven't been remediated and the contamination of drinking water is still an issue now. Um, it's, it's a big reason why COVID-19 even hit the Navajo Nation so hard is because of the lack of access to clean water is, is one factor. So I, it's just, you know, it's not that I want to like 
fo- catastrophize or focus in on the negative, but I want to, I want to pull some reality in behind these, these sort of nostalgic romanticized ideas because there's deep injustice there and it continues. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Next slide. So at that time, uh, all simultaneously as we're beginning the testing, there's this uranium boom because after we dropped the bombs on Japan, um, you know, there was the, the cold war kind of began shortly after, and there was this push to develop domestic uranium. And I'm, um, you know, I'm just kind of like condensing this history a little bit. A lot of you probably already know it. Um, but the government was basically saying we need uranium that w- we process here. We'll pay you if you, well, we'll pay you very well if you can go out and find it. So people were prospecting all over the Colorado plateau. So uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, Navajo Nation, north of there, Capitol Reef National Park was allowing uh, uranium prospecting and mining, which is crazy. Uh, Moab, Utah was a hot spot. There was, there was little shops all up and down Main Street where you could buy Geiger counters. Uh, people were, wealthy people were flying in from the East Coast to prospect. You also had working class folks that otherwise worked in ranching or, you know, at the oil rigs and they wanted to get a slice. So that there was very much a uranium boom. And the culture that followed that was interesting because as you can see, I pulled some, um, you know, magazine and book covers and this uranium burger here at this cafe, fairly ridiculous. But, um, you know, people didn't, didn't know the dangers of it at that time didn't fully understand the radiation, um, didn't fully understand how they were acquiring it through dust or just disturbing the soil, things like that. But there was this, this definite, like, all American, like, yay, go get it and get rich and do that whole thing. And like also gold. This, like sci-fi thing that starts to creep in a little later and then the space race and stuff happens. But yeah, it has a, it's reminiscent a bit of the gold rush in a way. It's sort of like the modern gold rush. Most definitely. And, um, you know, the Navajo Nation was particularly exploited in that endeavor. And, and you can imagine because the deep injustices that already exist for indigenous people in the area, it, it was times two. So we have the mining. There's the mining and the testing and the exploitation of the Navajo Nation and Western filmmaking. Yes. So all of these are sort of happening at the same time. Yeah. And the overarching, the overarching driver of that, of course, is the Cold War. Right. So. I, I think, did you say next slide? We, we yeah. Have a, yeah. Let's go on. Cool. So this is just a sign that was outside of Moab, the uranium capital of the world. Uh, This is a map of the Colorado Plateau, uranium frontier, it says. Uh, So, you know, it's kind of astounding to me that because very many people, you know, Cedar City and, and southwestern Utah were sort of the the folks that caught the brunt of the fallout from the testing at the Nevada site. But Also, people in the eastern counties and Salt Lake, too. I mean, the radiation spread all over the country. Um, But it's it's astounding to me that people were digging up the uranium to make these bombs that were then raining down on that same area. So they were just getting poisoned from both sides. Next slide. So this is an interesting, like, little moment of triangulation. So you have these westerns being shot. Uh, this this is the iconic last doorway scene of the searchers, and you know cinephiles, but also people that just like westerns a little bit. I I think the movie is pretty insufferable, honestly. But um, this is a very recognizable scene, and you have this rugged frontiersman. It's it's he's gone and rescued the damsel in distress. During the time they were shooting, the Van Diem Corporation is there already starting to mine uranium. Uh, there's, there's kids playing, camping, drinking near these mines. And years later, you know, John Wayne would go on to shoot The Conqueror in Snow Canyon, Utah, which you all on the ground there know where that is, very close, one of my favorite places on earth. And they had just done the Upshot Knothole series at the Nevada test site you know, not long before that. 
And that was one of the dirtiest ones. If you ever hear of Dirty Harry, that was part of that series. Mm. And it, it was just awful. Some of the people I talked to for the vinyl record, I mean, the things that, that happened, the effects of the radiation after that were, were terrible. And when this crew shot, it was, I think, 160 people or so. Um, you know, there was hot dirt there. Hot dirt meaning irradiated dirt that had fallen into the canyon. And they're, they're charging around on horses. They're kicking up a lot of dust. They're breathing it in. They even shipped it back to Los Angeles for, for reshoots. Oh. So they're throwing this red dirt into their faces even, even beyond. So in the end, about a third of the, of the cast and crew developed cancers that statistically didn't make sense for the population and the, the numbers. And, um, you know, several of them died years later, including John Wayne. And that was at a moment where it didn't, it didn't push the movement forward for downwinders per se. And I spoke with Janet Gordon, who's an incredible, I, I can't even say enough about her, an incredible activist. She's 82 now. Um, and she told me lots of different stories. She helped people testify before Congress to get the radiation compensation. Um, but, but John Wayne with his notoriety, you know, didn't change their endeavors, but elevated that for the culture because there was some somebody in the government that said, oh my God, we killed John Wayne. And that quote was kind of heard around the world. Um, so, so there's this very, I feel like bringing it together for this show at SUMA, kind of, you kind of get everything related in, in this image. And of course, so you can go to the next, uh, I think it's a clip. We'll play it for just a second. repeat forever. Um, so thinking about all of those things, I, I went in with the help of a VFX professional and erased John Wayne's visage, his body, uh, leaving just enough to, to kind of like understand that there's something missing. And I wanted to start with, with erasing the icon in order to, again, break that fourth wall, again, look at the setting and the backdrop. Um, which is Monument Valley and the injustices that exist there. Also, um, what in many ways led to his own death, but I'm using him as a sort of touching point for all the people that were affected. Uh, but in doing that, I didn't want to just focus on the, on the movies like, like it was already part of the history. So again, with the erasure and then the erasure of what happened on the Navajo Nation, the erasure of the, what happened to the downwinders, I wanted to do that, you know, due diligence. So uh, next slide. Tried to hit it tw yeah, twice. Oh, there yeah, we go. That we that's, go. that's how it is installed. It's in that kind of long um, space in the museum. And we should say that it, it is it is at SUMA right now. This is part of what yes. is um, at, at SUMA. So anybody watching um, can go and see it now up until May May 1st, along with the other pieces that are in this From Dust uh, installation exhibit. Yeah. Um, so basically, I... I, I had this realization recently where I think I'm like a documentarian hiding in an artist's career. Um, <laughs> Wait, I just have... I was going to ask you about that. So yeah, please continue. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So I, I have this kind of like inclination to do almost this journalistic investigation into things. And that's, that's what I felt inclined to do here. So starting with the racing John Wayne and sort of getting, getting him and all those notions out of the way... Um, it felt important to collect some oral histories and and sort of let let people speak that from their own mouths and their own experiences without me really mediating it. So I, I was able to speak to some people. Um, you can go to the next slide. I'm trying to think if this is next. Um, so I, I 
borrowed some stuff from the University of Utah Downwinder archive. I also spoke with several people on the, on the Downwinder side. And I made a vinyl record to kind of literally put these stories on the record, elevate them in the culture, use a nostalgic object from that period that feels familiar, again, feels intriguing, um, and also kind of speaks to that era. And on the flip side, I collected um, oral histories from Navajo uranium miners. And this is a movie, I, please watch it. This documentary is incredible. It's by Jeff Spitz. I worked with Jeff Spitz to use just a little fragment of audio from the film talking about uh, the shooting of the searchers and the mining that was happening there. Uh, next slide. And uh, this is John Wayne with a Geiger counter in Snow Canyon. <laughs> Um, so you can see that there was some awareness, even though there was very much a, a campaign to downplay the dangers of both the testing and the mining, but especially of the testing, because it was, you know, unhideable. People were going out to watch the, the clouds and the tests and, and everything. Uh, next slide. So this is the insert for the record, and it's, it's a bit hard to read. Let's go to the next slide. Um, that just sat in the record player. And... Um, yeah, so putting, putting these stories in the exhibition and inviting additional stories felt extremely important to me. Uh, next slide. We saw the flash of light. It was quite oh, bright. I it was, it was anything like that. We were sitting inside the house, but I can tell you, it shipped that old house so bad that it was really scary. During this time, they warned us that they would be telling us to get under our desks for safety's sake, which is pretty stupid, isn't it? <laughs> So that was uh, my friend's grandmother, Barbara. I'm, I'm so thrilled that she was willing to talk to me. And that's, that's very um, typical of people, especially in the Cedar City area, that do remember um, either watching the tests or watching the, or, um, the period of time where they were happening. So side one is hot milk in reference to the irradiated milk that was um, coming out of the livestock that were grazing you know, on grass that had fallout on it. And, so the Nevada test site, it's 170 miles west of, of Cedar, where you all are, and you can't go there, you know, kind of for obvious reasons, but it's interesting to me in terms of visibility and, you know, sort of what we're allowed to know about our own history that has affected us so deeply and, and for folks, you know, many folks poisoned and, or, or had very life-ruining consequences. Next slide. So you can see it on satellite. And you can see the craters that were created from the over 1,000 tests that were detonated there, some many times larger than the bombs that were dropped on Japan, by the way, which is something that's sort of shocking to me that it's not a more widely known thing about the history in our country. Uh, so I, I wanted to also bring this up and, and visualize this site in a confrontational way. Uh, next slide. Oh, these are people watching the tests. Um, th that's quite a crowd of people. They used to have events, like in Vegas, they would have cocktail parties where they would go out and watch the bomb and they would advertise that at some hotels. Wow. It's, it, it's pretty crazy. Uh, next slide. This is sad. So, um, so this, is, this is some of the markers of the radiation falling down on livestock that, were, that people, that ranchers in the area started noticing first. And people, you know, there was a real reluctance to believe these, you know, poor farmers that are just patriotic and want to support the effort, but they don't know much, you know, was the, kind of the idea. And a word I heard over and over again, talking to people and also, you know, reading this stuff for all these years is, is expendable. Hmm. And, you know, people were treated as though they were sort of justified in having, having them be collateral damage just because it wasn't a very populated area. Hmm. And when the wind was blowing, you know, toward Las Vegas or LA, they didn't test. If it was blowing toward Utah, they would test. And these are documented things that you can find in various forms of history about this. And it's, it's pretty shocking. Next slide. So I, I took a um, satellite photo of the site and I used some software and, and different, you know, technology to translate it directly. And uh, I made a four by four foot topography of the site itself using, you know, a real image. Next slide. So that's what's in the show. And you can see the craters. 
Uh, I put some bright lights behind it. And, uh, you know, I, I think it looks like pretty cool because I really like maps and, and stuff and I feel satisfied by it in that way. But again, you know, the, the beauty or I'm, I'm not interested in making it hip or beautiful per se. I just want to create that hook. What is this? What is this site? Oh, this happened there. Oh, it affected all these people here. Oh, I didn't know. Um, and that's kind of my my basis and my intention for this show. Um, I, it's very much dedicated to, to downwinders, which includes people affected by, by uranium. Uh, so that you can see the record player there. Yeah. Uh, next slide. You can go ahead if you had a thought, Lynn. Yeah, I was just going to say, and, and maybe this kind of an overarching thing, but, uh, you know, historian, activist, documentary maker, and artist, you know, and, and it seems like you, you have um, evolved into this m much more complex artistic um, form in a way. And I know in one of the articles I read, you, you talked about that responsibility of the artist. Um, and in the article, you were talking about it in relationship to how artists are able to interact with the 1% to maybe get some of these ideas out. And I wondered if you just might comment a bit on on that on that role um, because I think it's it's uh, it's not that I mean, other people do it as well but you it seems such a powerful passionate merging of all these things in your life yeah oh thank you so much that's quite a compliment um, you know there are so many I have like very I have many different feelings about this there are so many incredible activists that that work on you know nuclear issues um the and i put this this um i put some different qr codes in the exhibition i forgot to put them in this presentation but please if you see it in person do scan those because those resources are incredible and i i owe you know all of that research to these different platforms uh but there are there are activists and people working on climate stuff and climate justice and nuclear issues that are I'm, I'm completely in awe of, and I, I don't deserve the credit that's anywhere near what they do. Um, I think that there is sort of like people that do that work, artists are translators, or at least that's how I feel. Mm. Um, I, I want to be engaged in that work, and I, I am when I can, but I don't want to pretend that the art is enough to be qualified as activism. I think of it as translation and because, and especially in Miami, this is very clear to me um, because I'm kind of, I feel like a bit of a freak over here sometimes working on all this kind of Western stuff and all this deep land use stuff. Um, and sometimes I'm like, am I in the right spot? Um, but I think that me pulling these messages to, to people that are engaging with art, not all of them. And I certainly don't mean to sound um, like they don't care. I definitely don't mean it that way. But I, I do engage in, a, in an art world that, that is concerned with the market and collecting, um, is concerned with different things. And so if I'm bringing that message there and putting it there, if, if somebody sees this that has no idea about the, what happened in Nevada and they see it in Miami at an art fair and they're like, wow, that's really beautiful. Oh, it's what? Then, then my, I've done my job in some way. And when I was talking to people to make the record, you know, I, I wanted to be as respectful as possible. I'm not trying to sell the record. I'm not trying to take credit for their stories. I'm just trying to hold them up. And I was a little nervous because I didn't want to, I wanted to make sure that all felt okay. And every, everyone was like, thank you for caring. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for amplifying because that's what needs to happen because we are on a <clears throat> very real precipice still with nuclear weapons, by the way, okay. it is not over. So if we, if we want this to never happen again, I'm going to do my part from the platform that I studied and understand, which is art to kind of hold that up. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We are almost out of time and I want to make sure to get to everything that you wanted to get to. So, I'll let you carry on with anything else. Otherwise, I'll ask you a couple of parting questions. Sure. Um, we can just quickly go through the last few slides, only, only to say that um, 
I'm having a show here that opens on March 6th at the Hollywood Arts and Culture Center. Any folks from there that are out in the ether, um, I'm going to be continuing this idea of testing and the legacy of nuclearism, kind of expanding it in the Cold War context. So I get into some space race stuff and I'm making several smaller topographies that'll be an installation. Uh, so this is, this is the Nevada test site, the small one that I did before I did the big one. Uh, next slide. And oh, they have a secret feature. Um, if you are at SUMA, take a picture of the topography with your, your phone flash on. I painted it with reflective spray paint and it's cool if you see it like with a spotlight, but you otherwise can't see it too much as it, as it's lit. But if you do that, then you'll see this. Uh -huh. And yeah, it's kind of fitting to me, kind of a cool little secret. And I'm, I'm going to treat the other ones that way too. Those are two on, small ones on the side. And uh, you can go to the last slide. So this is a sneak peek of several of the, the pieces I'm working on. Uh, Kylie, if you're out there, thank you so much for letting me crash your pool house because I'm in between studios. Um, it's been a challenge. Uh, but these are, these are uranium mines and test sites, U.S. and Soviet from, from all over the world that, that, I'm, that I'm working on. Cool. So, yeah, feel free to ask any parting questions. And thanks for suffering through my long-winded, um, crazy world in a minute style. Right. No, this is amazing. I mean, so much of it I didn't, I'm, I'm uh, embarrassed to say I didn't know. I didn't know the effect on the film crews. I didn't know, uh, you know, the, the size of the bombs that had been dropped so close to here and how they compare to the, the bombs that were dropped on Japan. You know, there's so much about it as I was researching and getting into it that I, that I felt like I learned when perhaps initially I thought I was just getting in to learn about art, you know, an artist's work. <laughs> and excited about that but then to get into all of that was I think you know that's I think one of the things that is so powerful about what you're doing um we are going to be continuing our conversation on the radio today at three which will then turn into a podcast but my sort of parting question that I'd love to just ask you now um for this is what advice do you have for students? Um, you know, this is a, we, we have students watching, we have students in the room, this kind of thing. And I wonder for any aspiring artists who may be grappling with some of these ideas of identity in terms of uh, pursuing aesthetic and pursuing, uh, for lack of a better word, activism, but or, or a platform or that kind of thing. Uh, what, what advice do you have for, for anybody wrestling with, with some of those topics? Yeah. Um, I, I would say, you know, tell, tell your story, um, and branch from there. Be, be true to that, which sounds kind of trite, but I think that people get into the weeds a little bit when they, um, are trying to leverage something that isn't totally, totally true to their experience. You know, there are always exceptions, but I think that's like a good rule of thumb. Um, always be respectful of any subjects that you work with. And I, that just can't be overstated. And I think that, um, you know, I, I have written articles as a sort of side thing, uh, mostly art reviews and stuff like that, but some other sort of like, like the piece that you mentioned about the obelisk. And I think that that was a good practice for me. Maybe, maybe some advice would be to find something similar where you're acting in an investigative way and you're kind of abiding by some of those principles of respect and interviewing and, and using stuff, you know, um, respectfully. Because I thought that was really informative to me. And also being able to write and articulate what your ideas are clearly is, I don't know if this was a good example, this talk or not, but um, I think that that's a good practice for any young person, any student to to get into. Well, I love that you, I love all those things that you mentioned, and I love that they all go towards curiosity, you know, and, and I yes. think that that's one of the great tenets of of knowledge and learning and, and education is, is that development of that intense curiosity, whether it leads to an investigation or whether it leads to activism or whether it leads, whatever it leads to, but that curiosity can, can, bring, can bring fuel to, to anything. So thank you so much for that. 
I've really yeah. enjoyed everything. I've loved learning about your work. I've loved learning about this history of, of this place that I've come to know as home. So I'm excited to keep the conversation going. But for now, we'll, we'll sign off and we'll say thank you so much. I, thank you for sharing everything with us. Yeah, thank you for, for enduring. <laughs> well, it wasn't endurance. It, it was sitting. a celebration. So with that, we'll sign off for now and we'll see, hopefully hear people on the radio. But otherwise, thank you so much, Kara. Bye. Bye. Bye.